Now let's look at the stomach as the next portion of the gastrointestinal tract. The function of the stomach is uh, to be involved in digestion to the extent that the stomach is responsible for chemically digesting food through secreting a strongly acid uh, juice which acts non-specifically and uh, to acidically hydrolyze um, material present in the food which reaches the stomach to enzymatically digest food using specific enzymes called zymogens which are secreted by the epithelium of the stomach and to mechanically digest food uh, by churning the contents of the stomach and this is accomplished using a very thick and robust muscular wall which the stomach has. The principal part of the stomach we'll pay attention to, although not exclusively, is to the mucosa and specifically we'll be looking at the arrangement of the uh, epithelium and the cells which make up the epithelium. First you should refresh yourself that the surface of the stomach has some openings in it, many thousands of openings, and these are referred to as gastric pits. Gastric pits are tubular openings into which the contents of gastric glands are secreted. Depending on what part of the stomach we're looking at, the pits may be either short or long. Where the pits are short, the glands which open into them are generally long and simple tubular. Where the pits are long, the glands which open into them are generally short and uh, complex and branched in structure. The generalized structure of a gastric gland, as these glands are known, is as follows. The gland itself is an invagination of the surface epithelium. The surface epithelium is made of surface mucus cells, and as it invaginates, we form a pit. The first part of the gland is referred to as the neck of the gland, and there are a variety of different cell types found here, but for our purposes we'll consider the neck of the gland as being the location of either the stem cell population, which give rise to all of the gland cells, or the specialized mucus cells called neck mucus cells, which are similar in appearance, but not the same in the mucus in which they secrete as the surface uh, mucus cells. So this is the neck of the gland region. When the stem cells divide by mitosis, they either migrate upwards uh, to form uh, surface mucus cells or neck mucus cells, or they can migrate downwards to form neck mucus cells or this cell population, so-called oxyntic or parietal cells, or this cell population, so-called chief or zymogenic uh, cells. Beneath the neck of the gland is the mid-region of the gland, and throughout much of the stomach the mid-region of the gland has one predominant cell population, which are shown here in red, and these are the oxyntic or parietal cells. And the function of oxyntic or parietal cells is to secrete the uh, stomach acid. Interspersed among these are scattered neck mucus cells, which produce a little bit of watery mucus, and then also the third cell population found in the stomach glands, shown here as the purple ones. These cells actually predominate in the lower third of the gland, and these are called chief or zymogenic cells. And chief or zymogenic cells secrete enzymes which become active in the acid environment of the stomach. Finally, normally down toward the base of the gland, we come across a, a small population of cells. Uh, there's far too many of them shown in this particular cartoon diagram. These are enteroendocrine or diffuse neuroendocrine cells um, and are part of a distributed system of endocrine cells found everywhere in the mucosa of the gut. The function of these cells is to release hormones which act both locally and at a distance to regulate the behavior of both the mucosa and the muscular uh, component of the gut as well as the behavior of some of the glands associated with the gut. Now let's look at a um, microscope slide of the stomach. Here we're going to look at a region of the stomach that in fact borders on two of the anatomical regions. Uh, one of the regions is here and the other region is uh, here. We're going to concentrate at first on this side. And we'll increase the magnification somewhat so we can see some of the features here. As you'll know from lectures, the stomach has a series of permanent longitudinal folds in the mucosa that extend approximately along the long axis of the stomach. And these are the rugae. And this here is a section through one of the rugae, and here is a section through another of the rugae. Uh, at this magnification, uh, what we can see is the epithelium or mucosal layer, which extends from here to here and covers the surface of this fold or ruga. And the core of the rugae, which we can see here where the pointer is, is made up of submucosa. Even at this magnification, it's possible to make out the quite distinct muscularis mucosa that sits just underneath the mucosa and separates it from the underlying submucosal connective tissue. 
Here also is submucosa, and outside of the submucosa is the muscularis propria or muscularis externa uh, layer of the stomach, the muscle layer of the stomach. And as we'll see, this is quite a robust layer. It's actually described, and one of the differences between it and the muscle layers elsewhere in the gut, is that there is a third layer of muscle present here. So there's an outer circular sorry, outer longitudinal inner circular and then an innermost oblique layer. However, it's very difficult difficult often to make out three distinct layers. And really what we'll concentrate on seeing here is that there's a fairly thick muscular layer that appears obliquely oriented and perhaps we'll get a sense of how as this muscle contracts it will cause a churning action in the gut. But to begin with, let's look at the um, one of these rugae and let's look at the gastric glands which are uh, associated with the mucosal surface. So here we're moving toward the uh, core of the ruga here. Here, running up here and here, we can see, perhaps you see it better here, along here, the muscularis mucosa, which separates the mucosal surface here from the submucosal connective tissue here. In the core of the ruga, the submucosal connective tissue is loose to moderately dense connective tissue, and you can see that, in fact, this material is highly uh, vascular and contains some fat as well. Moving toward the surface, here's the muscularis mucosa. So here's the mucosal part. And here we find the uh, surface of this ruga, uh, which we'll look at in a little more uh, detail in just a moment. The surface of the stomach lined by mucosa is along where the pointer is following just now. And the foamy or light appearance we can see here are surface mucosals and uh, neck mucosals which line the, uh, the pits, and we can see some of the pits here. The region extending from here to here is the glandular portion of the stomach. And all you can really make out of this magnification is that there are at least two distinct regions to this population of glands. One extending from here to about here, in which the cells and the material appear broadly eosinophilic, red or pink staining. And a second region from here to here, in which the cells appear dark uh, hematoxylin staining or dark blue or purple staining. And as we'll see in a moment, this is reflective of the concentration of different cell types which are present. Moving again now, first to the surface, again at this magnification, here's a pit, here's a pit, and we can see the surface mucous cells sort of foamy appearing with tall columnar nuclei. We'll move now to the uh, topmost magnification. And here we see a pit. Here's the uh, surface. So these are surface mucous cells. Here are their columnar nuclei. We can see that as we move down here, the shape of the cells changes slightly. And in fact, we, uh, if we were to look a little later, we'd find that some of these cells change to become uh, neck mucous cells. Moving back in magnification a little bit, we're now going to move into this portion of the gland here and have a look and see what the uh, cell types which are present here look like. So we're in the upper one half of the gland uh, approximately. Now one thing that you might notice uh, straight off is the presence of a large number of these very eosinophilic red stained uh, cells. Cytoplasm appears quite punctate or spotty looking uh, as we increase the magnification. And these have broadly round nuclei, uh, pretty euchromatic. The boundaries between and margins of each individual cell are pretty distinct and the nuclei are pretty distinct and sharp looking. And these are oxyntic cells or parietal cells and their function is to secrete acid. There are other cells interspersed among these parietal cells. <coughs> uh, we won't pay too much attention to these. Some of them are neck mucous cells, and some of them, like these thin uh, nuclei we can see here, belong to stromal fibroblasts or myofibroblasts, which are found in the very thin, almost invisible uh, connective tissue which extends between the glands. Now let's move a little bit further down into the gland. And as we move down, uh, we start to find a new population of cells here. Some of them we see in the upper half of the gland, scattered. But as we move down, they start to become the predominant cell population. And these are the zymogenic cells, the ones which secrete enzymes, also called the chief cell population. And we can see that their nuclei are not as neatly round as are those of the oxyntic cells. Uh, and also the margins between the cells, or the boundaries between the cells, are rather indistinct. Distinct. Many of these cells have a foamy appearing apical cytoplasm which represents their cytoplasm after they have secreted uh, zymogen. And so in this region of the gland you can uh, 
pretty well compare the appearance of oxyntic acid secreting cells, such as this one here and this one here and this one here, with the surrounding zymogenic secreting cells, such as this cluster of them here, or perhaps a very nice cluster of them here, or indeed we can compare them here where there's one oxyntic cell. As we reach the very base of the gland here, present in this region, but very difficult to see, and almost in fact impossible to see without special staining techniques, are the enteroendocrine cells. So please don't spend time looking for them. Here's the smooth muscle of the muscularis mucosa. We can see a little bit of uh, lamina propria here. There's some blood vessels present in the lamina propria, and a few scattered immune cells. In places in the stomach you will find um, some small lymphoid aggregations, clusters of maybe several hundred immune cells, um, but we'll see lymphoid aggregations elsewhere in the gut a little later. We can contrast the previous appearance of the uh, stomach with this portion of the stomach which we can see here. Again, here's the mucosa extending from here to here. Here's the muscularis mucosa, and here's the submucosa underneath it. Uh, it should be immediately apparent to you that here the pits are very, very much longer than they were in the uh, prior portion which we showed you, extending deep down into the mucosa. And the glandular portion is the pale staining portion which we can see down here. And we'll look a little bit further at a little higher magnification here at what we can see. Here again, here's a long pit extending all the way down. We have surface mucus cells which extend down into the pit and then are replaced by neck mucus cells at the lower reaches of the pit in the upper part of the gland. And then here we see the gland extending down here to the uh, muscularis uh, mucosa, which you can see here. It should be immediately apparent to you that the cells in these glands look quite different to the ones we encountered uh, previously. Um, they aren't strongly hematoxylin staining or strongly eosinophilic uh, staining and in fact they stain as sort of a foamy appearance so this is indicative very often of cells which are mucus secreting so this is perhaps from a part of the stomach where the glands predominantly secrete mucus. Here's the muscularis mucosa sitting underneath and then we move into the submucosal layer which is loose to moderately dense connective tissue extending from here to here. There's some fat in here and yes you should be able to see it's quite vascular with a large number of blood vessels uh, present. Here are the muscle layers and as I said the muscle is organized as three layers in the stomach although it's not always easy to see uh, three distinct layers. Really what I want you to take away from this is look at the thickness of the innermost layer of muscle here which extends from here to here. Now this is in fact made up of two obliquely spiraled layers of muscle and then on the outside is an outer circular uh, layer of muscle in the section as it's cut here. This is in fact a longitudinal uh, strip of smooth muscle which we can see and it's considerably thinner than the inner layers. The combination of these closely wrapped oblique layers of muscle on the inner aspect with the longitudinally oriented uh, muscle on the external aspect allows the stomach to contract in a sort of a ringing or uh, churning uh, style and this is what uh, mixes up the uh, solid food material with the gastric juices and ultimately goes on to form the semi-liquid chyme.